So those were the things that kept me going. Um, just trusting my body for one, it was a, a definite surrender, a definite level of trust, a vulnerability um, that comes with that. And, and then just trusting and just remembering that our ancestors did this for years and that um, it, it, it's the natural way that we were designed to bring life into this world. And so um, it's a very empowering, um, experience. Um, it's very beautiful. Uh, with each birth, birth a new version of myself as well. Um, from my initiation into motherhood and then my initiation into motherhood a second time, I was a whole different person then. And I'm definitely a whole different woman now. <laughs> for tuning in. This is part three of Desiree's birth story, um, birthing through the decades. If you haven't seen part one and two, the link is up here. Definitely go check those out. This is part three, her birth story, her home birth story with her daughter, Peace. Um, we talk about induction, um, patient rights, um, your due dates and thinking of it more of a due season, how to tell when you are in active labor, what are the signs, the delayed cord clamping, and also options that you can do with your placenta. So definitely stay tuned. We drop so many gems within this episode. Thank you so much, Desiree, for your vulnerability, for sharing your story, and definitely stay tuned for these gems it is such a beautiful beautiful home birth story let's get into it so we can talk about my third pregnancy and delivery <laughs> which uh is by far um i hate to say a favorite because I, I obviously love all my kids the same but it is definitely my favorite um um, birthing story. Uh, it, so the transition between my second pregnancy and my third is is about seven years. <laughs> I like to spread spread them out. Um, and I have completely changed as a woman. Um, I have now been introduced to more holistic practices. Um, I am. I had. I had gone through a, a evolution of kind of questioning. Um, the uh, practices in Western medicine um, and realizing that um, a lot of what I'm doing is just treating a symptom and not necessarily getting to the root cause of the things that these women um, have been involved in. Now, I've now worked in women's health. I've now worked in primary care. I've now worked in mental health. Um, and I've also now worked in endocrine. So I've been in a lot of different health spaces. I've also worked in functional medicine at this point. I, I, I'd really seen a lot. Um, and I've educated myself a lot more um, on health and the body and, and the anatomy and how it all ties in. Um, and so coming into this pregnancy, um, it started out brand new from the beginning. Um, I am now older. Um, I'm what some would consider high risk pregnancy age. I was 35 um, when I got when I um, got pregnant, um, and so I'm in the high risk category. Um, and I do this because that's according to conventional medicine reaction. standards. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> high risk. We are not old. Exactly. These are just the, the terms. If you're too fat, too thin, too small, too young, too, just to keep you in fear and to keep right. you in, in this um, birth is an emergency. Birth is, right. you know, an emergency of things. Like Correct. That. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. So given, given my, uh, previous experience with my second child, 
um, I wanted to be in more control of my, of my uh, pregnancy and delivery. And so um, the first thing I knew I wanted was a African-American midwife or OBGYN to um, assist me during my prenatal period. Um, that was a choice that I made for myself. And I will say the midwife during my second pregnancy was also African-American, although I did feel that she was not for me. So take what you all, will from that. All skin folk ain't kin folk. Into, Correct. Into Correct. them. Correct. And so um, I started searching for um, a, a Black OBGYN or midwife. And um, I found one. They were all in practices that were all inclusive. Okay, and so when you're in those spaces, um, you will meet all of the staff members because it, you don't know who will be on call at the time that you go into labor. And so um, although I initially went to that practice because of the African-American um, doctor that they had there, um, I never actually met her during my time with them. Um, I was consistently seeing the same Caucasian woman over and over. And um, at this, at this point, uh, I had had um, a thyroid test that had came back a little bit borderline. And so they weren't necessarily diagnosing me with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, but they were saying that I had the potential to have a thyroid disorder. And so um, she initially wanted to just put me on a thyroid medication, even though all of my thyroid hormone levels were normal. Um, I had some antibodies that were a little bit abnormal. And so she wanted to put me on a thyroid medication. I opted not to do that. Um, I, if you cannot definitively diagnose me with a thyroid disorder, I'm not going to just take this medication. Um, and so with the, I don't want to say resistance, but with the resistance <laughs> that I gave to starting that medication, they told me, the doctor says, you know what? I'm looking at your numbers and I know the nurse was telling you that you should take thyroid medication, but you can just take selenium, which is a, a natural mineral that aids in thyroid support. And so I took 200 milligrams of selenium um, through my first and second trimester. They checked my um, thyroid hormone levels with each trimester just to make sure that they're staying normal. And they actually um, were fine throughout the whole thing. And so finally, I had, but each time I went in, they would say, you have Hashimoto's, right? And I'm like, no, you know, I do not. And so I finally had to ask the doctor, look, straight up, do I have Hashimoto's or don't I? She says, no. I says, well, then please remove that from my chart. Please, ladies, be informed of what is going into your chart because that is going to follow you and that becomes a part of your medical history and it follows you throughout your life or however, whatever you continue to send to the next practice, that's going to go with you. So look over your chart. Now we have all of these options of being able to connect directly to our chart through emergency, uh, through EMR on your phone and things like that. Opt to do that. Have if, access to those if, records. If it, if it suits you, read the records yourself and get informed with your own body. I know with- um, Absolutely. With the gestational diabetes test that we had at 28 weeks, they were telling me that my levels were higher, but when I'm doing my own research about it, um, I felt comfortable with where my levels were at. And so I decided not to do- the um, glucose testing with the, the three with hour drink. Mm -hmm. I simply did the fasted one. Um, mm -hmm. so I was like that is an option you have. To yes, it is. But yes, because is. I didn't take the gestational diabetes test, they then wanted to proceed with, you need to bring us back um, blood sugar sample mm. three times a day for the last five weeks of your pregnancy or we're going to induce you at 38 weeks. That is when wow. I exited out of that practice. That is when I exited out of that care and I found a new provider. 
Um, yeah. You don't have to do any of these things. You don't have to like go by their rules. You have options, you have choices. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. And, and um, all while I was going to this OBGYN office, um, I was still searching for um, someone that I could connect with on a deeper level. So I was, I was still searching. I'm like, gotta be a home birth midwife in my area somewhere. So I was looking into home birth as well as birthing centers. Something that was out of the traditional hospital setting, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I was very apprehensive about going back into the hospital and having my daughter there. It's also now the middle of a pandemic as well. And so I was nervous about that too. Um, I got pregnant in um, April, uh, May, excuse me, I got pregnant in May. So, or I found out in May, I was probably pregnant in April. Um, and so, yeah, it was like right at the height of this, of COVID. Um, and so I went through my entire pregnancy, you know, during, throughout the whole pandemic. And, um, and so thankfully I ran into um, the midwife that I met. She has been doing home births in our area for decades. Um, if you say you have a home, that you had your baby at home, her name comes up first. Um, she is uh, a nurse midwife. You have to be a nurse midwife here in, in North Carolina in order to um, deliver. Not every state requires a midwife to be a nurse, um, but here in North Carolina, they do. And there's, and there's, there's no, she's more skilled than someone who's not a nurse. So I just like to preface yeah, that. Literally just the different papers, titles that each state likes to recognize. They have Correct. certified professional midwives for some states, right. licensed professional midwife for another state, certified nurse professional midwife in another state. It's just the same titles with the different Yes, states. correct, correct. Um, and, um, and so um, the midwife that I found was, is also an herbalist. Um, she's very much holistic minded. Um, and as I started, so I made that transition at 20 weeks, um, to full-time, just her practice, um, full-time, all my prenatal visits, everything. Um, uh, the, I will say that the OBGYN office I was with, um, was very, um, open to listening to me. They were very helpful in that way. Um, I will also go back a little bit and say that after Destiny, um, I got pregnant again and I had what is called a blighted ovum. What that is, is uh, a pregnancy sac without a embryo. So it was like, everything was progressing normally, da, 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 da. But then when it came down to the actual growth of the embryo, that didn't happen. And so I got to eight weeks. I believe eight to 10 weeks before the bleeding started. Um, and that's when I went in, they did the ultrasound. It showed that there was a sac there, but that there was no embryo there. And so um, they also offered me misoprostol in order to uh, um, empty out the uterus. I opted not to do that this time. Again, I've, I've learned, right? I've educated myself more on this process. I'm a lot more holistic and natural minded. I'm believing a lot more in my own body. And so my body knows how to expel this on its own. And that's what it did. Um, it, it expelled, it, it expelled it, it's on its own. I went back, I got my levels checked again. I got another ultrasound and my levels were going down. The, pregnant, the pregnancy had resolved um, itself. Uh, or the sac, you know, had it resolved itself. And I went on from there. Um, and so, um, given my history, I, I got ultrasounds and things a lot earlier with this pregnancy than normal because of my history. Um, I wanted to make sure right away that this pregnancy was there, that it, there, there was a heartbeat, that all the things were going as, as, you know, as it should. And so, and so this office was, was very much, um, uh, uh, accommodating in that way. They were like, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, I was, I was appreciative of that. Um, but again, I wanted to be in a different space. I wanted to have more control. Um, and so I made that transition over to 
my midwife um, fully at 20 weeks. Um, I do recommend you starting from the beginning. If that's what you know you want um, and, and, and that's available to you in your area and you're not um, a, a high risk, meaning not by age, but by um, health, you know, you don't have like high blood pressure or diabetes or something like that, then absolutely, um, you know, my, my, I do recommend um, a, a midwife and a home birth if that's something that you're interested in doing and you're able to do. Um, because it took me, um, and I knew, I knew that I wanted to home birth from the beginning, although I wasn't yeah, always too. pursuing that. Right. I, I still went like the more conventional route with the um, right. testing and stuff. But it still took me until I was 35 weeks pregnant to find a provider that I was comfortable wow. with because I waited. So yeah. I, I had been with midwives the entire time. And so it's just like, don't, don't wait. Amazing. Right, it comes right. To go build that relationship from the start. Yes. Like build that. Re- yes, so much better absolutely. Than you are comfortable with your birthing team. They know you. They know your preferences, and you are you can really let go and have like your dream birth when you have absolutely that support. Absolutely, um, visits are longer. Yeah. Um, you get to spend a lot more time with your midwife in that setting. Um, and so you're able to get to know each other um, on, a, on a deeper level because you're spending more time with them. Um, I found out that a lot of the things that happen um, during your pregnancy um, in a conventional setting is not necessary. Um, some of the testing they do is not necessary. Um, and so I opted to be a lot more natural in this experience. Um, I had already gotten a lot of my testing done with the OBGYN that I saw prior. Um, But um, coming into, it was a very warm and welcoming experience each time I went in and saw my midwife. Um, Check the baby, you know, listen to her heart rate, asked a lot about how I was feeling um, mentally, physically as well. Um, And, you know, we did the urine test. I did all that. I did my blood pressure screenings and all of that at home especially during the pandemic, some of my, vir- my visits were virtual. Um, and so I did all of that myself. I was, I, they gave me a little kit that I came home with and, and did myself. Um, they kind of showed me like that what to so look for, what not to. Yourself that you, you are capable. You can, you know, you can care for yourself. We do have this opportunity. We do have this knowledge. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and I would say that one of the pushes that, that kind of pushed me, I always knew I wanted to do the home birth like you did. Um, but when, you know, um, I was due for my pap test during this pregnancy. And so they did that and it came back because of my age and um, I had slightly abnormal cells. They wanted to do a procedure to um, look at the um, cells on the outside of my cervix. So they wanted to do a biopsy of that. And I thought to myself, I've had all of this unfortunate history around my pregnancies. I don't want them touching my cervix during my first trimester. And um, the nurse calls me and she, she's literally like, so there's some abnormal cells on your pap test. The doctor is recommending you have this procedure. We need to schedule it right away and do it in the first trimester. When would you like to have this done? And I'm like, um, I don't want to do this right, right now. Um, can it wait until after I give birth? And she's like, oh, well, let me ask the doctor. So the doctor calls me the next day and says, absolutely, you can wait. You don't have to do this now. Um, a lot of times, this type of abnormality on your pap test, pregnancy will clear it on its own. So you don't necessarily have to do it right now. Be informed, y'all. Nurse said you got to do it right now, today, right away. So the thing is this, if I was not educated and knowing what I know, I would have opted to schedule this procedure and I would have done that in my first trimester. And I could have potentially miscarried again. Um, because now you're compromising the health of your cervix while you're pregnant. Um, because I knew no, better. You may not know your cervix is the opening that holds your baby in during the pregnancy 
and it's that 10 centimeter that dilates to allow your baby to enter into this world. <laughs> like this mm -hmm. big. baby gonna be this big as it is in the world. He's like, it opens up <laughs> this big. <laughs> it's good. No, it's gigantic. <laughs> cervical sweeps since we're on that situation um that is a common way that midwives would like to induce women at the end of their pregnancies um and a cervical sweep is literally them taking their fingers and sweeping your membranes of your cervix to release it in efforts to induce um the baby to come right oftentimes it does not work and it is very painful for a lot of women. Um, so unless you are in a super rush to have your baby, um, you you don't have to. Um, and a lot of times it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't help things move faster anyway. And also you could be opening up to um, infection because that mucus helps block that. So just some things to be aware of. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Perfect. absolutely, absolutely, and 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 I t I spoke about that with my midwife because of the fact that I was induced with my other two, um, and I and I really saw myself as being induced with my third, or you know at least you know following the trend, um, and she said that they can induce labor with herbs, absolutely, and so um, that was reassuring as well. She was like, there are other ways. We don't break your water. Uh, we don't do any of that stuff um, and we can get a labor going when we need to. She was like, believe me, I know how to get a baby out. <laughs> so, you know, with her 20 plus years of experience, uh, I trusted her. Um, another thing to mention was in talking about my history with her um, and sharing my birth story with my, oh, that um, for my second pregnancy, um, again, that's when she shared that a lot of times you tear because you're pushing, you don't know how much pressure to give. Um, and so you you just go for the gusto and you push the baby out a lot faster and you end up tearing. Um, she was like, a lot of times with proper assistance and with being able to learn how to pace yourself and push at the right you know, intervals, you don't always tear. Um, still, some things are inevitable and, and just, you know, everybody's anatomy is different. So you may tear all things considered. Um, yeah. which is totally normal too, but just, you know, tears are more common in a hospital setting because of the fact that you are, you're kind of on a time limit. I mean, I, I learned that There's no kind um, about it. If your water is released for more than 12 hours, they consider it an emergency and they're ready to give you a C-section. So it's like, if you're not progressing in the time limit, because for them, it's about money. It's who it's correct. Who you out of this bed. So yes, and get the next lady in. Right. Exactly. Right. So the longer and so, you're in this bed, the less money that they're able to get. So thank you. Exactly. And I did learn that um you are actually, I think, supposed to dilate one centimeter an hour or something like that, the way that they time you. And so if you're not following that schedule, then they call you failure to progress. Correct. And they want to do a C section. There Absolutely. Is no for a lot of women, I'm yes, caveat, yes, there are some women that have a failure to progress. Yes, yes. One centimeter per hour is not, this is not based on any type of average. This is literally just their hospital standards of what they want. It's not based on what's best for women's bodies, how we normally progress. Some women take hours to get to five yeah. centimeters and then dilate all the way in 30 minutes. So it's just everything's right. different in that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it, it really does vary. Um, you know, again, to touch basis on the glucose testing, you do not have to drink that sugary drink that they give um, that has potentially harmful, harmful ingredients for you and the baby. Um, you can do m ms or jelly beans or whatever it is you can um just eat 
You can that, eat- a fasting test. You can eat a high glycemic breakfast. Just eat some toast and a banana and, you know, anything to get your, you know, a little bit extra sugar into your system. Um, and then they do have a more natural um, sugary drink as well, which is what um, I did um, with the midwife. But there are options. And, and you, you can choose to decline this test if you don't want it. Right. You can decline any test if you don't want it. You don't have to have any testing during your pregnancy if you don't want it. So please always never feel backed into a corner because they will make you feel that way, especially in a hospital setting. But you can decline anything you want. This is your body. This is your baby. Your intuition will tell you what you want to do, what you don't want to do. Trust also, you that. don't need cervical checks during labor if you don't want them. Thank you. That as well. And that's also a part of a birthing plan. Hence why it's important to have that. You can put in there. Do not offer me pain medication if you're seeking to have a natural labor. Do not do cervical checks to see how far my labor has progressed. Some, some women find it um, discouraging if they've been laboring for three hours Eerie. and they've only dilated maybe half a centimeter or no dilation at all. So some women choose not to do that. On top of that, with cervical checks, you are introducing the, the um, risk of an infection. It's, it happens. So, uh, you know, I don't find it to be very, fairly common. I don't know. But there's always that, you know, you're like you said, you're opening up. So you're, you know, introducing that 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 risk. Um, or you can say only check my labor if I or only check my cervical um, dilation if I ask you to don't offer it to me. All of these things don't touch me while I'm in labor. Um, you know, don't talk loud, you know, like all of that stuff is Child, don't up breathe loud if I'm right. around me. Like this, get out of my face! Get out right. of my face. Loud. Yes, I yes. Know. You can do this however you'd like, and it even if you want it, choice, choice. And even if you're choosing to give birth in a hospital, you can opt to labor outside of the bed. You can decline an IV. You can decline the constant fetal monitoring. You can you can choose what's best for you. Um, and what aligns with you and your family and your, you know, your, 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 your morals and all of that. Don't feel like they have to be compromised because of the setting in which you're choosing to have your baby. And that for me was the most important part. Um, <laughs> I was able to have my daughter at home. I was, I was in complete control over the whole experience. And like Tori said earlier, the discomfort that you have during your laboring process is a whole lot mental than it is physical. Can you take me through your labor with? So yes, uh, I was, like I said, preparing myself to go past dates and be induced. I went into labor on my own um, yeah. a week early. I wanted to call, I wanted to do a caveat on the date. Um, I really believe that we need to revolutionize the way that we see babies being brought into this world. Um, babies are not late. They have their own times. They have their own birthdays. They have their own rhythms of why they choose exactly. to, to come here. Babies can come anytime between 35 and 42 weeks. It is very common for babies to wait until 41, 42 weeks, and they are fine. They are healthy. They are vibrant. Yes, it is absolutely us that are missing out on yes. our true ovulation dates or our conception dates that miss time. It it is a whole six week window. We need to think of it more as a birth season. My baby is yes. Doing springtime my baby right. is in an april in an yes. september in that type of thing instead of this one date because i feel like that is a lot of pressure around women at the end people text it you three days past your due date when you gonna get your baby i will get my baby when my baby decides to come thank you stay out my cervix that's right <laughs> 
And I love that you brought that up because that's exactly the way it's presented in certain settings. Like this baby's got to come or your baby is too big. So let's take the baby at 38 weeks or whatever the case. You still can be monitored. You can still choose to wait, to allow this to happen on your, on your own. Your body knows, your baby knows. And so you have to be Your able to have a certain amount. initiate the birth yes. process. There is a chemical that stimulates within their lungs that will initiate the birth process within you when they're ready to breathe outside of the womb. Right. So they are intelligent. They know, they have an understanding of when their body is ready, when you're ready, astrologically when they're ready, you know. So yes. And there's a, there's a much deeper connection that, I, that, that fails to be mentioned you know, during the prenatal period. Um, but that, that connection between yourself and your baby is tremendous. It's, it's, it's infinite. Okay. And the babies know exactly when you're ready, when they're ready and they will. And, and, and I believe personally with me, I was so, so, so set on going into labor on my own. I did not, I wanted to experience what it felt like to have your water break and for labor to start on its own. And so I, I, I meditated on that daily. I prayed on that daily. I journaled on that daily and I called that in and I prepared myself mentally to go into labor on my own. I had my yoga ball. I was doing all the pelvic opening exercises and everything to get my body ready to go into labor on its own. And I did, my water broke a week early and um, it was it was odd because I was kind of feeling like a little different that day. And I had all these things that I was supposed to get done in preparation for postpartum, you know, my meal planning and all of that. My mom was here. We were supposed to be getting all of our freezer meals together and all of that. And I just didn't have the energy to really do any of that stuff. And um, I went to bed and I was kind of like, oh, my stomach is kind of like uncomfortable, but, but it's probably like Braxton Hicks and stuff still, you know, but as the night progressed, so did the, so did the intensity of this, of these contractions. And, um, by 5.00 AM, um, they were coming on pretty consistently. I had downloaded the little app to count them so that I knew when to call my midwife. Um, and, uh, so they were coming on like every five to seven minutes. And I was like, oh my goodness, okay. And so I got up to use the bathroom and my mucus plug came out. And I was like, oh, okay. Now my mucus plug had came out with my second child too. And, and my labor still didn't start. So just because you, you lose your mucus plug doesn't mean that your labor is starting. Also, um, our waters can release and seal back up. So that's the thing, just because your water is released that doesn't always mean that the contractions are going to start. Some people have leaky waters and they will leak and close for three days a week. Right. They're not starting until those things are consistent. Correct. <laughs> those and, the mucus, <laughs> and the mucus plug can come out in sections. So you might lose little pieces of that throughout the pregnancy. It rebuilds itself. So you, so just because you lose that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to go into labor. Um, still, you know, contact whoever, you know, you're seeing, but just understand that, you know, as long as it's not met with a bunch of contractions and all that stuff, um, that that mucus plug can regenerate itself. It does regenerate itself. Um, and so it came out and I thought, oh, okay, you know, got the contractions. Now the mucus plug that came out, I'm like, all right. So I went in and, and shared with my mom and my partner that my mucus plug, it came out. And I was coming back in my room to lay back down and the water broke. And so when the water breaks, like she says, it, it can back up. So I started to lose water. Um, I was super excited because like I said, I had never lost water, broke, had my water break before. It was super like, I can't believe I'm experiencing this. Um, but I was very excited. So I called the midwife, I told her and she says, okay, she says, when contractions are coming on stronger, let me know, you know, this and the third, but get some rest, get lots of rest, drink your water <laughs> and rest. So, that is a huge, huge thing for women that are about to be in labor. Don't stop for labor until labor stops you. 
if you, whatever you were going to do that day, continue to do it. Do not get yourself all riled up in your head and stop everything that you're doing. Keep going. If you were sleeping, child, sleep. Yeah. Eating, eat. If you was cooking, yes. going on a walk, finish doing all the things. When you, when your labor will, will stop you, when you can no longer do those things, your body will tell you. But until mm-hmm. then, keep moving about your day. Keep, keep going. And, and it will progress a lot easier when you're not in your head about it, waiting on, oh, well, labor can go on for three days. And keep that in your head every time you think it's something. You don't know it's something until you're pushing that baby out in that minute. There you go. (laughs) Just in your head. It can go on for three days. I'm just going to keep moving. I'm just going to keep sleeping. I'm just going to keep eating. (laughs) Right, right. Just continue doing it. Have that and you will be fine. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yes. And, And that's what I did. I laid back down. I laid back down and then I um, got up and I was like, you know what? We got to get this meal prep game situated. So we created a little list so that we go to the store. I had a whole dresser to put together still. I hadn't done that because I really anticipated myself going past my due date. And so I was kind of like dragging my feet. And so um, I was like, now I got to get this dresser together. I was still, you know, I put a little pep in my step because I'm like, okay, within the next two or three days, this baby's going to be here. So I need to do what I got to do. But um, <laughs> yeah, but the contractions that I had been feeling that morning kind of dissipated and I really wasn't in a lot of pain. And so I was like, hmm, okay. Um, the one thing that um, became a concern was that um, the midwife called me, she checked on me and she said, well, when you lost, when your water was breaking, like, was it clear? And I'm like, no, because my mucus plug had came out first and that had a little blood with it. And so it kind of had like a little tinge with it. And so she was like, okay, well, we want to come by and just check everything out. The um, concern was that the baby had pooped in the uterus and had swallowed that meconium. And that was mixed that, or excuse me, that was mixed in with the um, fluid. Um, and so she- That is also I thought, a very common thing babies poop on the way out my daughter did it I know a lot of other babies do it Mm -hmm. it doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be an emergency situation I would do the research and look at it for yourself how you feel right there are so many healthy babies that come out with the poop right right (laughs) so I thought they were coming to just check me make sure everything was cool and then they were going to leave because they had another lady who was in labor too they came with all their stuff and I was like, oh, hold on. <laughs> What's up? What's going on? And so she was like, um, they checked me and I was already four, four centimeters dilated, I believe. And so she's like, we're going to get this labor going. Let's, let's get it going. She's like, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and do she it. wants to be in labor all day. Right. So, so they started giving me these herbs. Okay, since we were talking about herbal teas, I wanted to introduce a beautiful offering that I have, my Labor Ready Tea. Um, This herbal offering was handcrafted to shorten labor times and to regulate contractions once labor has actually begun. An herb in this tea, catnip, was been used historically among black midwives to stimulate regular um, contractions once active labor had begun. While I was attending a birth, a lot of you know I am a doula, I witnessed these herbs work firsthand in being able to take this mama's contractions from 10 minutes apart to five minutes apart and it was just astounding with the regularity not only is it nourishing for childbirth and beyond it is simply delicious with these tropical infusions while this blend was formulated for labor it does have a multitude it has a 
It has a multitude of benefits. The ingredients in this blend have been known to relieve menstrual cramping, to nourish the body with antioxidants, iron, mm. magnesium, mm. calcium, vitamins, B, C, K1, and mm. potassium. It's known to aid in weight loss by stimulating the metabolism, be anti-inflammatory, relieve menopause symptoms, reduce high blood pressure, even boost fertility in women and in prostate health in men, and a lot more. So let me show you guys this tea. So this is my my personal batch. And as you can tell, I've been drinking it um so delicious so delicious look at all of those delicious looking ah <laughs> uh, man delicious looking and tasting so definitely check out birthkeeperapothecary.com to get this beautiful offering I am offering a sampling of this tea as it will be launching this summer. If you are interested in it, sign up for our VIP list. As of today, we still have nine more spaces to be able to try this tea in your home completely free. So go over to the website, sign up, sign up for our VIP list and reply so you can enter to try this tea for free i mean who doesn't want shortened labor time so back to desiree's video thank you guys for tuning in but anyway it wasn't bad tasting or anything it was liquid and she was just and i would just take a little shot of it like every 20 30 minutes um and we did that for probably a good couple, few hours like a couple of hours i was doing that and right while this is happening, we're eating, we're dancing, we're listening to music, we're, we're, we've got all the vibes going, we're getting things set up because I was planning to give birth in the birthing pool, so we're getting that set up, we've got the air mattress blown up, we, you know, just everything is just, you know, going right, moving right along, you know, um, and then um, I'd say a couple of hours in was when the contractions started kicking in and getting a lot more intense, um, and so at that point, we considered that, like, the real start of like, I was technically in labor, but now I'm in active, what they would consider active labor. Um, and so I was able to kind of the, and, and my midwife was so, uh, so attentive to me and my wants and needs that she made sure that I was able to rest, that I wasn't being overstimulated by too much other stuff happening. Um, and that the people who were there to support me were really allowing me to have the space and time to go through this process the way I wanted to. And so she's like, you know what? Let's cut these lights down. Let's cut this music. You know, at first we kind of had like hype music playing. She's like, let's tone it down a little bit. If, you know, if that's what you want, she's like, you want to play the hype music? That's cool too. Well, but if you want to- She helped Sylvester relapse, so you know. There you go, <laughs> there you go. I need she was like, or, you know, she know, but it was completely my choice, you know, and so, once the once the vibes were set, I'm laying down. The the um, contractions are coming. They're they're tolerable, but each um, as the labor progresses, the contractions obviously get stronger, um, and it's very much a mental thing. Um, yes, it's uncomfortable, um, but you can also move around. So mm -hmm. different positions help me a lot, mm -hmm. and I don't think I would have been able to fully completely give in to these contractions if I had been just stuck in the bed, you know, with an IV, you know, but, but, but because I was able to move around, I was, I was laying down on the air mattress. I was sitting up on the side of it. I was on my, I was on my yoga ball. I was standing oh, up. Oh, I, at home, I feel like we are um, unrestricted with our vocals a lot easier. And yes. our vocal cords are literally a mirror to our cervix. Mm. So that moaning sound that we are naturally going to make oh. during these contractions helps us be able to open up that mm, those low um, tones that's opening up. It's resonating through your body to be able to get you to be in alignment. Yes. Like in a um, 
setting that is in a home, you might be a lot more conscientious of your sounds that you are making, how they're sounding, or other people may come in. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mm -hmm. you're being too loud. I am Mm -hmm. drawing my baby into this world. I don't want to hear nothing. Yes, exactly. Because Uh you're right. You, You can feel like maybe you might be disturbing the woman next door or, you know, maybe her birthing experience is not ideal. Maybe she's triggered in some way by your sounds or whatever. And so you, you are more mindful of that in, in a hospital setting. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought up the, the voice and the channeling and the connection because um, when I was in the middle of the contractions and things, I kept wanting to hold that pain mm. here. And, and so when the contraction would come, I would go, <gasps> and I would hold it. And the midwife says, breathe through that pain and make that sound. Um, and that helped me more than anything. And um, we recorded the whole thing and I would love, it's in bits and pieces. My mom did, it's in bits and, bits and pieces, but there was, the, yeah, there was a time where I was on the floor and yeah, is she, is she doing it? Yeah. <laughs> that's right baby that helps so much and I was on the floor and 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 we were doing that and it just really helped me to be able to relax to be able to you know kind of kind of get into that space and let it and just push right through it um and when it's time for you to have the baby you know that intense pressure happens that feeling of needing to push happens um, like most people who have probably in my labor where there was a baby coming out of me whether I wanted it or not there was or not my body was getting her out it yes time she was yes entering this world and I could not grunt bear stop any of it you absolutely know. absolutely and that intense pressure that you feel on your backside um is the baby coming ready to come um and so at that point I got into the birthing pool I I opted to get into the birthing pool at the end um and so I got in there um at the end and did my pushing in the water um it was so relaxing to be in the water in that warm water um and I put so I I'm pushing and you and you've got that ring of fire feeling that they speak of, which is essentially, uh, I, I guess, just the crowning uh, and the cervix, you know, and the baby coming through. Um, and I was very vocal at that point. <laughs> and so I'm pushing and I push and I could feel the head and then I couldn't push anymore. So I stop and I feel her retreat back in. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no. That was my progress. <laughs> so she said, it's okay, it's okay. That happens. With the next push, you'll have the head out. And so, and that's exactly how it was. I still pushed her out fairly quickly. Um, it was probably, can you still hear me? Okay. It was probably about four or five minutes at that point. And she was here. Um, I did not tear this time around, which was amazing. I know, I was so excited. I was so, so excited. Um, she, again, and, and this is just to give a little bit of, um, compa- a little bit of a comparison, okay? So when my daughter was born, I pushed her out. She was in the water. She comes out, she comes on, she, she looks right at me, what's up? Right. And so, and so I'm, and I'm looking at her and look, we're both, it was a picture of us both looking at each other. Like, Hey, and the adrenaline comes. I think it's around, um, after the cervix fully opens, a rush of adrenaline comes, which wakes you up, which wakes your baby up. Everyone in the room, up. it's a, uh, it's a noticeable shift in the exactly energy. That's exactly how it was. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's those exactly babies how it was. alert. They ready to meet you. They ready yes. to speak what's up with this world yes yes and that's exactly what happened she's she comes out and she's got like these big eyes and she's just looking right at me and I'm looking at her and um but she was but she didn't cry right away either okay and so 
the um, midwife um, was doing little things to kind of get her going. She still wasn't crying right away. Um, and so um, we, the midwife, we'd already discussed delayed cord cutting, um, which is just allowing that blood, all of the blood that's in the, uh, um, from the placenta and the amniotic, you know, excuse me, the umbilical, from the placenta to the umbilical cord um, to come all the way through. That last little bit of blood is important to them. Um, it's, it's enough. It's a third of their blood that Correct. is in the placenta at the time of birth. So that is right. um, important for a lot of mothers to give their babies that third of, you know, the blood that was meant for them. Exactly. And so, um, and so, you know, they already knew that that was, you know, that stand, that's the standard in their, in their practice is to not cut the cord right away. Also, I wanted to note that a lot of babies take some time to transition um, into, but they are getting their oxygen from the placenta and from that cord. So you don't have right. to worry about them um, not being able to get oxygen because the same way that they were breathing within the womb, obtaining their oxygen from the, the placenta, the umbilical cord, they are still able to do as long as they're connected to it outside of the womb. Exactly, exactly. And so um, some time had passed and baby still wasn't breathing the way we wanted to. And so she did, did end up having to cut the cord a little earlier than she wanted to. She had, um, she had given her a little bit of oxygen, still we weren't hearing anything. Um, and so she ended up having to give her um, rescue breaths um, and, and to get her going. And all of this sounds like it could be very traumatizing, right? But I'm saying it was very, with, with, with ease and peace. It was a very peaceful experience, even though it was prolonged it was nothing like what happened with my middle child. The energy around it was not fearful. Correct. It was more of, okay, this is what we're going to do. Yes. Well, we're, we're yes. going to help her out a little bit more instead of, oh my God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, I started to feel, I, I didn't necessarily feel any sort of those anxious feelings coming up. Um, and the midwife held it together so well, right? So let me tell you a little bit of backstory. So, so, so my daughter's name is Peace. She starts breathing, okay? And everything's fine. And um, the midwife, you, you kind of see her, you know, a little, you know? And uh, uh, her dad helped out a lot. Um, it's usually a two midwife team, right? She's got, I've got the midwife and then I've got the, the birthing assistant who's like a midwife student. And because me and another woman were in labor at the same time, the main midwife had to leave, okay? And so we were there with the birthing assistant who I'd, who I'd spent a tremendous amount of time with throughout my entire pregnancy. So it wasn't like she was a stranger. But what was so funny is that at the end of it all, we find out that I was her first labor on her own. She had not did it alone before. And she had always done it with the main midwife. And not only that, but she was like, she was scared shitless when the baby didn't breathe right away. But she held it together so well. None of us knew that. No, you would have never, ever, ever known that that was her first time doing a labor by herself. She was almost like, she was perfection when it came to that. She handled herself perfectly. She did everything right, in my, my opinion. Um, she handled, I mean, I'm just so, so, so grateful to her. Um, and so after birthing the baby, after, you know, getting her breathing and all that good stuff, um, she, she was fine. You know, again, uh, I think like you said with Kinsley, you know, Ted's had a lot of that that fluid and mucus and everything still going on in the in the, in the nasal area and all that. Um, and um, should we, I get out the water because I've now I got to push out my placenta. So I got out, pushed the placenta out. Now all of this happened obviously with my other two kids, but I don't remember it, and I didn't feel it because it just it just comes out, you know, afterwards, and I'm still numb from the waist down and all of that. So that wasn't anything that I was cognitively aware that was happening. 
And so this time it was very intentional. It's like, okay, now we're going to push out your placenta. Um, I push out the placenta. I have a very healthy placenta. It's huge. Um, she gives the people there a beautiful lesson on the placenta and, and, and how it works, you know, in relation to the baby and all of that good stuff. It was so cool. Um, I'm breastfeeding. Um, I've gotten lots of help. Um, with my midwife came a lactation consultant who I met prior to having the baby and who was going to come in and see me like the next day. Um, and, you know, she was there with me for hours after I had the baby helping me clean up or not helping me clean up, but cleaning up things, helping me get up, um, get myself to the bathroom and have a urine, you know, have my first urination and checking the bleeding and all of that stuff. And then helping me get in the bed and making sure I'm comfortable and making sure the baby is comfortable. And she was there. I mean, I had my daughter at, uh, 11, I don't remember, what did I tell you, 1249, something like that, I think. But anyway, she was there with us till almost like five in the morning. You know, she was, she, she held it down. And this woman was with us for forever. And I appreciated her so much. And um, we had snacks, we had water. I was able to drink juice and eat and all of that the entire time. Um, the freedom of being able to move about my house and labor in wherever I wanted um, was absolutely beautiful. I could have labored in the bathroom, on the toilet. I could have labored on my living room floor. I could have labored, you know, in my room. I could have labored in my backyard. I could have labored wherever I felt like I wanted to labor at. And that would have been my choice and would have been okay. Um, it wouldn't have been seen as unhealthy or any of that. She did fetal monitoring by just applying the fetal monitoring system onto the stomach. I wasn't strapped up with anything. She just listened just to make sure that there was any sort of just signs of distress happening during the labor process. Um, I opted to have two cervical checks at my own discretion. Um, one was when they first came and the other was when I felt that immense pressure to push and wanted to see where I was. Um, and I progressed pretty quickly into being ready to push. Um, but all of that was my choice. All of that was my choice. Um, and so it was just a total night and day experience from my other two labors um, and my third. It was beautiful being at home already. Um, I could get in my own bed. I had on my clothes. Um, you know, it, it, it just, everything just felt right. It, everything felt natural. You know, um, the, our bodies are already made to do this. All the interventions that are that they do just aren't necessary um, all the time for everyone. Um, they're great for those who need it, but are not the standard, you know, or at least should not be the standard. 35% of women do not need a cesarean, and that's facts. 39% at some hospitals. It's not 39, that is not, no everything no and also epidurals it is very common if you have an epidural and then your baby goes into um distress that is a very common situation the epidurals ramp up the contractions on the baby and those muscles are not giving them the time to relax so they get tired too yeah so it's yeah yeah, the one one the system to lead to to something else. Exactly, Where, and you know um, one 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 lasting thing that that was like, um, just touched my heart in like the the weirdest way. With my first two pregnancy deliveries, right towards the end um, of labor, when you're getting ready to push, I got the shakes really bad, and I was just like shaking 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 and they made it seem like that was abnormal that I was getting myself worked up that I needed to calm down and breathe and this and the third and what I found out is that that surge of shake that you get at the end is totally normal and it happens because your body is getting ready to push out this baby it's like that last surge and that shake that you feel at the end is what you need to help the adrenaline that you need to help push your baby out. 
And so if anyone has experienced that or ends up experiencing that later, that is normal. That is not you having a panic attack, a seizure <laughs> or anything like that. That is your body doing exactly what it knows how to do to help get your baby earthside. So that I just wanted to throw that out there because all this time I had thought that that happening to me at the end was me having some sort of crazy panic attack at the end um, from being scared, nervous or whatever. But really it was a total natural thing that my body did on its own and that it was supposed to do. To help you. Right. <laughs> yes. All right. Our bodies know, our, our bodies know, our wounds know. Babies out. They know how to grow them. We don't have to consciously think to grow a heart, to grow a lung, right. to grow a kidney. Right. Why, why do we have to consciously think to give birth? We don't. Right. You do not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. The interventions, all the things that happen, a lot of them are unnecessary. And our um, don't to to get more money for hospitals. They're not made for the betterment of our babies, for the betterment no. of health, for the betterment of ourselves. Um, no, just- no, it, it was a very much of a night and day experience. Um, my mother and um, my partner's mother both said, they were both here at my labor and they both said themselves that if they had known that that was an option for them when they were laboring, that they would have opted to do the exact same thing. Now, my mother was born at home. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom, my grandmother had all her babies at home. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mother, you know, had us in the hospital and didn't know that that was something that was still allowed, that that was something that was still done. And um, when I first told her I was having a home birth, some, some people thought I was crazy. Why would you have a home birth? Technology has came so far, you can have your baby at the hospital. You know what you want for yourself. Don't ever let anyone discourage you or make you think you're crazy for wanting to have your baby at home or for declining certain things even when it comes to your labor. Even if it's your mother, your grandmother, your partner. Partner, nobody, nobody. You have to do what's right for you, you um, and, and your baby, exactly. And um, no matter what people thought about me choosing to have my baby at home, most people thought it was really dope. Most people were in support. Uh, my mom didn't necessarily support or unsupport. She was just not as educated about it and didn't, and just didn't know. She just wanted to make sure that, you know, me and the baby were going to be in the best of health. Um, but after being here and witnessing it, um, she has a whole different outlook on it. She was like, man, I would have definitely done this if I had known this was an option for me. Um, and my partner's mom said the same thing, like, man, this was, this was beautiful, you know? Um, and it really was, it was a very beautiful experience. I felt and was in total control. And I also want to say, I am blessed to have been able to labor the exact way I wanted to. It happened the exact way I envisioned it happening. That's not always the case for every for every mom, you know. And and so even if you plan on having a home birth, and you know something happens and you end up at the hospital, you still can have you can still have control over your labor and delivery experience. Um, don't feel def- defeated in that, you know, um, just, you know, still go with that flow, still keep that surrender and still trust that your body and your baby are still going to get here in a healthy manner, no matter what that looks like. Um, my cousin, your plan is so important because your plan yes. will go with you no matter where your birth happens. Yes. So if you're at home, Correct. follow it at home. If they're in hospital, they follow it at hospital. The plan is gonna stick with you. That's why That's why it's so important. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't wanna think about what if I had a cesarean, but you need to go down yeah. all of these roads, these possibilities. Right. Or the only simple fact that if it happens, you want those choices to be honored and you don't want to have to make all of these decisions at the last possible moment to be able to make them so right having that you don't have to have like the resistance to um answering your your uh preferences for the situations that you don't necessarily want to happen just know that in this case scenario my choices are going to be honored 
Exactly. No matter what. Exactly. Yes. My my cousin, um, she was like, me and her were pregnant at the same time and actually do um, at the same time as well. And she gave birth five days after I did. And she chose to have her baby at the hospital. But still, although she had her baby at the hospital, she still had a natural labor. Um, she still uh, labored however she liked. Now she pushed in everything in the bed, but she was able to sit up and move around and do different things in her hospital room um, within reason. Um, Cause there are certain things that they just won't allow you to do at the hospital. And then um, before she went into labor, me and her discussed delayed cord cutting. And so she requested that. Um, she, um, me and her spoke about um, doing the placenta encapsulation, which I did with mine. And she was also able to do that with hers as well. She did have to sign a release form for them to release her placenta to her. Um, and, and she brought a little cooler with ice to be able to take it back home with her. Um, and so I say all that to say, if you end up ha having your baby at the hospital, if that's what you're choosing to do, or if that's what ends up happening as a result of you know something happening during your pregnancy, um, that you can still have control and you still have say so um and you're still able to make you know have their your wishes honored um it, it'll look a little bit different but you can still have that um and so it's just really just making sure that we're knowledgeable um ask questions um question why certain things are being happy or happening or even if they're necessary um and if your gut or your int or your intuition is telling you that you don't need something or something's not right go with that for sure, because I did all of those things during this pregnancy. And I think that all things considered are what contributed, you know, to how it turned out for me this time. Yeah, that's super important. Thank you for, um, for saying that, like, just listen, listen, be informed, drink Correct. water, go get your <laughs> plan right yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> this like trust trust the process trust your body yeah. and know that we are here because our ancestors have birthed safely at home in their power and we wouldn't yeah. be here today to be able to have these interview conversations if Correct. our ancestors weren't able to do this so just and that's honestly what kept me going mm -hmm. uh every time I, I felt like a little bit nervous I kept saying thousands hundreds of women have given birth child like mountains this. by caves in deserts child next to elephants this, all types that's of right elephants. this was the only way you know and at that time women were having like 13 kids you know and, and it was happening over yeah. and over in the same way and so those were the things that kept me going um, just trusting my body for one it was a, a definite surrender a definite level of trust, a vulnerability um, that comes with that. And, and then just trusting and just remembering that our ancestors did this for years and that um, it, it, it's the natural way that we were designed to bring life into this world. And so um, it's a very empowering um, experience. Um, it's very beautiful uh, with each birth birth a new version of myself as well um from my initiation into motherhood and then my initiation into motherhood a second time I was a whole different person then and I'm definitely a whole different woman now and um each one of my children is a representation of that evolution that has happened each time um and and that surrender that's had to happen each time even even with the you know for my first hospital birth my second and then my third home birth, um, it was a it was a, a definite amount of, of surrendering that has to happen. Um, but it's beautiful and it's and, and it's the most beautiful experience that we have um, and that connection that we get to experience. So for those who are looking to birth or birthing or you know, um, even if you're gonna surrogate, you know, you're a surrogate for someone else, you know, um, it's just a really beautiful experience. So I'm, I'm an advocate for a home birth if you're able to. Um, and if that's your desire, I feel like 
um, more of us need to get back in touch with that inner knowing that we have and just the natural essence of birth. Because you could literally just wake up, have a baby, go to bed <laughs> at night. Like it's, it's really that simple and it can really just be an integrated part of your day. Like this is really- For sure. You just had a baby today. I just had a baby today. <laughs> Here, yeah. so what you do today girl had and, a baby. You know, we had a baby and then we just went right to right right, right. So, yeah. it was beautiful thank you so so much Desiree for all of your wisdom that you have shared with us and your birth stories and just all that you have shared with us. I appreciate your story so much. Thank you. Um, if you guys have enjoyed this, we do post very often um, different birth stories. I have postpartum guide coming, prenatal guide coming. So definitely stay tuned. If it's not posted already, it's coming on. <laughs> yeah um, awesome make sure you subscribe to this youtube channel for more content like this and say bye Kimberly. Say bye. bye. <laughs> thank you so much for having me tori i appreciate you <laughs>